Thanks, everybody. Uh, hey, I'm Bob Schwartz. Uh, I'm just going to do a minute or two of introduction, and, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you. Um, got another one of our What's Now New York sessions. Um, I see a number of friendly faces. Uh, I see some new faces, which is cool. I see a few people that I'm affectionately calling regulars now, which is great. Um, so all I wanted to do is give you a little introduction of kind of where you are, a little bit about Capgemini, and I know everybody's anxious to get, as am I, to get to the speaker and, and kind of get on with the session. So uh, just a couple of words of, of in like introduction and uh, info setting. Uh, I'm Bob Schwartz. Like I said, I'm part of what we call the Applied Innovation Exchange. Um, you're in Capgemini's essentially two floors here in New York where we locate a lot of our innovation assets. So this is where some of the you know cool, sexy stuff is happening, where we're Capgemini, we're a global systems integrator. If you're not familiar with us, please see me like at the next networking break. I promise I won't talk your ear out. I'll just give you the, the elevator speech. But um, what we do here is basically work with our global clients to help them innovate. Um, and uh, I do that as part of something called an applied innovation exchange, which really means we're working with our clients, uh, our own capabilities, and even uh, what we call open innovation you know, startups, ecosystems, academics. This is just part of being in that dialogue, being real, being relevant, hearing what's on your minds, hearing from great speakers with new topics. Um, we're happy to do this. We sponsor this program just to kind of uh, give back a little bit, but also get to know all of you folks. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of uh, your evenings um, to, to join us. Um, be thinking about your, your questions and your interactions, because that's what makes the session great. And if you want to know more about Capgemini, the, uh, the Applied Innovation Exchange, or any of the work that we do here, I'd be more than happy to connect with you. So um, with that, let me just say welcome, and I'll turn it over to our moderator, Pete Line. Pete? Oh, no, I don't need that. I'm, I'm, I'm wired as is. We're going to, um, can everyone hear me OK? Yep. Yeah, we're going to dispense with the mics right here. Although we are live streaming, just so you know, and in fact, this is all going out, and we're also going to basically do edit video of this. Anyhow, thank you, Cap Gemini, Bob. Uh, they're great partners. We've essentially thanks for opening this space up, and being great partners in this series. Uh, I'm Pete Lydon. I'm the founder of Reinvent, which is a media company based in San Francisco, and I come out every month here to kind of bring a little bit of San Francisco and the Silicon Valley into, into New York here, cross fertilize it a little bit. And the idea of this series really started literally almost three years ago with Capgemini to really think how do we find really remarkable innovators in all these different fields and have them explain what's really going on in their space that people outside that field might not fully understand, but also to talk about what they're wrestling with right now. What are the things that are really bothering them? What are the things they haven't solved? What are the things they actually need more help with? And that's for sure what we're going to do tonight uh, with Eli Perzer. Now, there was a time not too long ago when uh, the internet was supposed to bring a kind of a, a plethora, a democratization of media, a plethora of choices. And in fact, I was part of that early crew in the early Wired magazine when we were figuring out where the banner ads were and you know, how to do commenting systems and all that. When we actually were just really supercharged that this was gonna be really transform the way media would work all for the better, that people would have more choices, the individual would be able to kind of get very, all kinds of different perspectives on things. They'd be better informed, they'd be better consumers, and certainly they'd be better citizens. Well, it didn't totally turn out that way, as we've kind of found over the years here. It, it turns out that the individuals with all those choices would actually pick and choose just exactly what they wanted to kind of see. And the technology companies and the kind of media companies learned very quickly how to actually give them exactly what they wanted. And because of that, we ended up with this situation where we really started to actually polarize the media and, and basically start to really get to the point where the individuals weren't really understanding what other people were doing on the other side of their kind of bubble. And uh, over time, this was getting to be a real big problem, which we've seen over time. Now, one of the people that saw this early was Eli Perizer, who's our speaker for tonight. And in the kind of the early, really as far back when he came out with his book in 2010 called The Filter Bubble, he started to see that, you know, that what was really starting to happen there and how dangerous that could actually be and how over time this could actually get very poisonous and very difficult, not just for the country at large, but also for companies and things like that. So for example, a company is trapped in these situations where if you're dealing with one group that's trapped in one bubble that's seeing the world through one set of facts and one kind of way of thinking, they're going to alienate, and the company kind of responds to that kind of view, they're going to alienate people in another bubble and another set of eyes and another kind of world that they see a whole alternative universe. And so this has gotten to be a problem for business, for the society, 
and for our politics at large. And so true to what we're basically doing here is um, Eli, for the, particularly since last year, since the last election, has been really wrestling with how do you pop this filter bubble? How do you actually start to bridge these communities? How do you try to reverse this process? And what he's going to do tonight is he's going to throw out some thoughts, give a little presentation to start here, where he's going to kind of chum the waters here with some of his thinking about what's going on here. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to come up as we do, as we want to do here, and uh, I will ha start a little conversation. I'll draw that out a little bit more, and then we're going to, of course, involve a conversation with you. We've got a lot of interesting characters from the media, all kinds of different sectors, and it'll be a really interesting conversation to go. So with that, I'm going to introduce, or bring, let's bring Eli on to kind of start the conversation. <laughs> and for folks who are over here, there, there are some seats over here if you want to swig around. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to this conversation. Um, and what I wanted to just to, to kick it off, I wanted to talk about uh, three things. I wanted to talk about sort of the why of the conversation. I wanted to talk about um, you know, what's driving some different theories on what's driving polarization and what's driving these bubbles. Um, yeah. Oh, I do need this? Oh, hi. Is this any better? OK. I feel a little more authoritative. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and then I want to talk about what I've learned over the last year about some potential solutions. And I think what you'll see is that different solutions, you know, solve for different problems. And that when we talk about this filter bubble problem, or we talk about the problem of polarization, that actually, you know, we're probably talking about a few different problems together. Um, and so I want to kind of like pull that apart in this conversation. Um, but let's get started. Um, Great, popping the filter bubble. Um, so uh, first, let's talk about goals, because I think um, while there's agreement that uh, bubbles are bad, polarization is bad, there, it's worth interrogating, like, what do we mean by that? Why do we think it's bad? What's underneath that assumption? And so I, I, I've found generally um, you know, these four sort of main strands, which is, one, you know, kind of if I don't know what I don't know, then I can't make good decisions as an individual. Or if we're not able to agree on facts, then we're not able to make good decisions as a society. Um, another one that I think I've become equally, I think we tend to think about this sort of in a, in a context of like rational discourse, where um, you know, I'm making an argument and you have a different argument, and if I can't hear your argument, then, uh, you know, then, then I can't think about it and I can't respond. I've actually become increasingly convinced over the last year that equally maybe more important is sort of the emotional version of that, which is basically um, if I don't understand your life experience, then it's very hard for me, for us to exist in a community together. And that that kind of emotional context sharing is as important for a democratic society as actually the shared facts. Like, the shared sense of, uh, uh, I understand what your experience is, um, you know, is really critical. And actually, you know, when you look back at the Federalist Papers or some of the kind of early writing about democracy, you know, arguably they weren't just, just thinking about this sort of like the marketplace of ideas. They were thinking about this problem of like, what if people can't understand each other and how each other are living? And how do you actually build a society when people have trouble imagining what it's like to be someone else? So I think this question of kind of reducing bias and, under, and increasing understanding is important. Um, a, third, a third reason to pop a bubble might just be like to understand the world, to see different pieces of the world, um, to be provoked. Um, and a fourth might be you know, sort of a premise that it's inherently good to be exposed to a diversity of ideas. And the reason I'm trying to, uh, this isn't an academic exercise. I think the reason that I'm starting here is that depending on what you, which of these things you care about, the solutions are actually pretty different. So if what you want to do is create cross-group understanding, that may or may not have anything to do with elevating civil discourse in like a uh, you know, rational, uh, uh, you know, high-minded way. Um, and so I think we just need to kind of keep this in mind as we go through the conversation, because, um, because what the goal is matters. So let's get to. What's driving polarization? Um, so uh, 
so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of offer five possibilities, starting with a filter bubble. But I actually think there's multiple things going on here. And again, you know, we sort of want to track all of these. So um, the first piece is this, you know, this idea that um, I helped to popularize in uh, 2010, that um, what's driving polarization in America is that increasingly, you know, we're all experiencing media through the lens of algorithms that understand or think they understand who we are, what we want to consume, and that are essentially you know, trying to serve us more of what we're most likely to engage with. And that this has a couple of pernicious effects. You know, one is it's, it's passive and it's invisible. So we don't totally know who these algorithms think we are. We don't know on what basis they're ruling information in or out. And so we don't know um, how to kind of adjust for that skew. Like if I pick up a magazine, I kind of know what the editorial viewpoint of the magazine is, but I know much less what the editorial viewpoint of Facebook is relative to me. And then I think the second challenge here is, you know, we don't know what we don't see. So, um, so the, the stuff that sort of makes it through this membrane, at least we encounter all of that. But all of this, all of this you know, diversity of ideas, um, we can actually, we can lose sight of how far off of a, you know, off of a common um, set of information we're in. So this whole thesis that social media is driving polarization, um, over the last year, a lot of people have been asking me about it reasonably. And I think, I think it's important. I think it's a piece of this conversation. But I actually think when we back up a couple of steps, it's not the only factor, and maybe not even the most important factor in what's driving this kind of phenomenon in our society. And so um, I, I think I, I want to just spend a moment on some of the other things that are, that are driving the sense of we're living in separate worlds. So one of the really important pieces here, uh, oh no. Um, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Um, <laughs> There we go. Oh, no. Back, back, back. Oops. Sorry, uh, there we go. So another really important piece that's happened, that's happened uh, over the last 30 years is this geographic self-sorting. So Americans, in particular, have moved. Some people have moved, and other people have stayed. And what someone who will tell you about the physics of self-sorting will tell you is that like, you don't need a lot of people to move in order to get a very polarized you know, environment. Um, and so what we've seen is that um, you know, Americans increasingly live in communities with people who think like them, with people who share their beliefs, um, and with very, uh, with very little exposure to people who think differently. Um, and some of that's because you know, a lot of people are moving to cities and are Democrats and are surrounding themselves with other Democrats. And some of that's because the result of that, I come from a small town in Maine, um, and I was looking back at my um, grade school class, which was 16 people. And eight of us left, and eight of us stayed. Uh, and um, there's like literally a one-to-one -one mapping to political party in that you know, leaving and staying phenomenon in my grade school class. So, um, so I think this you know, is another really significant thing that's just happened over the last 30 years. This isn't the way that it was 50 years ago. Um, but it creates this this fact that people don't have relationships, um, not only just across political divides, but also across class divides, that increasingly we just live with people who are very much like us, which I say as a Brooklynite who like goes to my little coffee shop and drinks my fair, fair trade coffee with my friends who are doing activism. Um, you know, I, I'm part of the problem. But, um, but ooh, wow. <laughs> this is really <laughs> Um this is appropriate for a talk on self-referential <laughs> issues. Um, so, uh, so geographic self-sorting is another part of the problem. Um, Pete, we shouldn't have let you touch the computer. <laughs> yeah. Where's our tech for Eli? Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that, but I didn't know what to do when my shoes untied in front of me. <laughs> Thank you. you. I'm going to. <laughs> I, 
I can, I, I actually, they're just pretty, they're just pictures. No, 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 <laughs> like, I can. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, great. Okay. Um, so uh, we're not actually going to dwell that long on the problem part because I want to get to the to the solutions. But um, here's another hypothesis, which is that the institutions that bound us together and that helped us see a common reality um, that we've lost faith and lost trust in them. Um, so the media as one, but actually, you know, it's striking that, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of institutions that people have kind of, th this graph did not look this way 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And what you see is that, you know, almost every institution is, is underwater except for the intelligence community. Um, but, uh, you know, if we lose trust in the, in the institutions that are, um, whose job is to kind of bind us together, then you'd expect that people would kind of go to their respective corners. Um, a, th a fourth hypothesis is uh, th this is actually an asymmetrical problem. And um, I think this is a piece of the equation too, and it's uncomfortable to talk about because um, you know, it's hard to have a conversation about um, uh, you know, seeing the other side and talk about asymmetries. But I actually think, you know, Empirically, when we look at the structure of media on the right and the structure of politics on the right, it does look different from what has happened on the left. And, um, and so, uh, you know, there's a whole set of polarizing dynamics that have happened in the American right that, don't, that aren't fully mirrored on the left. And I think this is a piece of the equation, too. Uh, here, what you can see is the sort of um, this DW nominate score as a way of looking at sort of the, the partisanship or the ideological nature of voting. And as you can see, Democrats like, have shifted a little bit to the left. Um, but you see this really sh strong shift to the right in Republican House candidates over the last you know, quarter century. So, DW, I, I don't actually, it's, it's, it's basically a technical, you know, it's something that researchers use to assess voting scores, essentially. Um, so, so this is a piece of the puzzle, too. Um, and I think the fifth piece that I think is the most provocative and that I've been really thinking about is, you know, I, um, I don't even know where this story came from, but I think I internalized a story which said, um, when people live in scarcity, when they're fighting over resources, then they're divided, they turn on each other, and they fight. And that when there's abundance or there's wealth, that it's much easier to pull people together and actually form one society. And I think the question um, posed by uh, this guy, Ron Englehart, um, and a book called Post-Material Politics is maybe that's exactly wrong. So what if actually when people live in scarcity, they have incentives to work together and they have incentives to trust common institutions and what if when we all live in an era of where we don't have to worry about our material um, needs, then we work our way up Maslow's hierarchy. We're more concerned about, you know, who am I in the world and what's my purpose in life? And that actually that is driving a lot of the kind of like identity driven politics that we're seeing right now. That um, the anxiety over where I fit into the world is more acute because we have you know, a, a, a lot of people have their basic needs met. And this would kind of explain why we're seeing this kind of dynamic happen, not just in the United States, but in places where there isn't a huge amount of economic inequality, like Northern, Northern Europe, um, and in lots of different places across the world. So to me, this is one of the most sort of provocative hypotheses that I've heard about what might be going on out there, what's in the water that's driving people apart, or that's driving people to their tribal corners. So um, now let's talk about what can we do about it. Um, so, uh, so here's my five 
you know, five, five uh, pieces. So let's talk first about what doesn't work in uh, popping filter bubbles and getting people to look at things from another point of view. So one thing that doesn't work that everybody sort of immediately goes to, and I do too, is like, well, why don't you have people just read you know, content from the opposite side? I'm going to like subscribe to Breitbart, or I'm going to uh, subscribe to The Nation, and you know, then I'll really understand how the other side thinks. And um, what studies show is that this, like, not only does this not work, it literally backfires. So um, when we read partisan, you know, polarized content from the other side, um, it reaffirms that they're assholes. And um, I mean, I say that on both sides. Like, everybody has that experience of like, yeah, I knew it. Um, and, uh, and people kind of actually get more, uh, more entrenched. Um, and so, uh, you know, having, having, you know, this sort of the, the, the easy solve of like, let's just all cross consume content doesn't appear to actually be a solution. Another thing that doesn't work, um, and this is more controversial, um, but often talking about difference actually makes it harder to overcome difference. So there's this tension, um, you know, in research about sort of, um, uh, you know, racial, uh, racial conversations and, and um, uh, racial diversity where um, on the one hand, it's critically important for there to be a conversation about race. On the other hand, when you talk about race, that brings people to, you know, that brings people's racial identity to the top of their minds. And um, when that happens, generally people behave in a more biased way, especially white people. And so, um, so there's this catch-22 of like you want to have the conversation, but having the conversation actually in a way can um, prime people to view things through a more racial lens. Um, and so, again, there are these sort of backfire effects where one wants to be careful, you know, not to just do the thing that seems intuitive because it can actually just dig us in deeper. I think the last piece, and I say this as someone, you know, who's a liberal or progressive, is um, part of what's going on is kind of this epistemic difference where um, people understand truth and understand, uh, you know, what exists in the world in pretty different ways. And I think liberals often assume in the solutions that they impose to, for these problems that conservatives share their way of thinking about the world. So I'll give you a very concrete example, which is that um, you know, there was this whole fake news conversation after the election. And um, immediately, a bunch of well-intentioned people said, well, let's post you know, uh, articles that really um, are set up by an independent panel um, that you know, say what's true and what's false. Um, There's a great study that came out that showed that the readership of fake news um, was almost entirely not the readership of the fact-checking articles. <laughs> like people who are inclined toward fact-checking articles and toward the idea that an independent pa panel would be a valid way of constructing truth are not the same people as the people who are consuming fake news in the first place. And I think if we don't wrestle with that, if we don't wrestle with the fact that there isn't agreement about what constitutes validity or how you get to validity, then it's very hard to get to how do you actually solve this problem. OK, so I've got eight possibilities of how, this will, how, how you can solve it. And I would love to then open up, um, after we talk, to, to more conversation about this, because this is definitely just a working list. But so, OK, so let's, let's jump in. Um. Um, so the first sort of obvious thing that works is like people having relationships with each other. That's by far, if you look in the like sociological research, having a relationship with someone who's different from you that is a real life relationship is the best thing you can do. <laughs> and you get back to the you know social sorting problems of we don't live with those people, we don't 
communicate with those, work with those people or communicate with those people. But nonetheless, like, this would be a great place to start, which is like, let's just actually know someone in a different group um, that reduces the biases we have. It helps us be more open to the arguments they're making. Um, it's, it's great. Um, another you know, hypothesis is, how can we actually use stories to build empathy? Um, and I'm really fascinated by the work of a group called Narrative 4, um, which this is a, this is a um, like right-wing anti-immigration activist in, I, for, I think, like Indiana, and uh, a recent um, displaced, uh, uh, I think he's Somalian. Um, uh, no? Nigerian. Nigerian. Um, and uh, and um, so basically the exercise is they both spend a day learning the other person's life story and then tell it back to a group, including the, the person they were interviewing, in the first person. Um, and so this guy is narrating his story from the first person. He's narrating this guy's story from the first person. Um, and what the initial research shows is that it's just really hard to, like if you're, if you're sincerely doing that exercise and speaking in the first person, um, you know, it's hard to hold your stereotype of the other group. Um, and so um, there's a question about like, how would you scale that? Um, but it, it seems like a really provocative approach. Um, here's another approach which I've been really fascinated by. So um, I've been, you know, one of the questions that I've been wrestling with is like, uh, what do we need these identity or these tribal structures for? Um, like what, what good do they do for us? And um, I started learning about um, my favorite name of a psychological theory of all time, which is called terror management theory, um, which uh, the terror in the terror management theory is existential terror. It's like, I'm afraid of dying. And so the premise is that um, because we're all mortal, um, we look for structures to attach ourselves to that give us what's called symbolic immortality. And that a lot of what human identity is about is basically finding things that we can like hold on to when we're afraid of being obliterated that say like, I'm part of the system that's bigger than me, that's more important than me, and that gives me a sense that even if I die, something that I'm attached to will endure. <laughs> so the way that this is studied is you induce like what's called mortality threat, which is you have someone write like a half page article about the physical experience of dying. Um, and then you have them answer a bunch of questions or you do a psychological study. And when you introduce in mortality threat, people are um, less open to new ideas, more attached to their political beliefs, um, and more subconsciously biased on a race or gender or any of the other dimensions that you might look at. You, you generally like hunker down with your in-group and are more biased toward whoever the out-group is. So if you flip that on its head, um, there's another uh, you know, sort of body of research called self-affirmation theory, which basically uh, is the reversal of that. So you can actually say, write an essay about things that you believe in, or um, write about you know, who you really admire, or write about something in yourself you really admire. And that manipulation turns out to have like, huge effects in the other direction. So people who um, reaffirm uh, you know, themselves or who, whose identities are, in, are affirmed are much more open to other ideas, are much more open to different kinds of people, um, and much more willing to listen to things that they might not have been willing to listen to. And I run a media company called Upworthy. We decided to like, actually test this out. So about a third of our uh, audience um, isn't into vaccines or doesn't, doesn't, isn't fully convinced about vaccines. And we were running an article that was an argument as to why you should care about vaccinating your child. Um, and for half of the people who came to the page at random, we showed this little box. It was almost like ridiculous. It was like this little box that just said like, hey, you're a great person for consuming this kind of content. Like, good for you. Um, and then we sent them on to read the article. The group of people who got that affirmation were much more likely to be open-minded about the information that was presented than the group of people who didn't. 
And so I, I think it sounds really like cheesy and kumbaya to say like, why don't we all just affirm each other? But I think actually psychologically, it's a really important part of the equation that we often skip over, which is like, how do you provide people that sense of warmth and security so that then in a domain that's difficult, they can actually have a hard conversation. Um, another related you know, approach here is that um, in these hard conversations, we tend to start from a point of view of positions um, and, you know, what you would learn from a good politician, I think applies more generally if you're a brand or if you're, you know, anyone who's trying to kind of like talk across, across groups, which is that um, if you speak in terms of what, you, what values you believe in, um, you do two things. One is, you know, human beings are always trying to ascertain motivation. And so actually like explaining your motivation, here's what I believe in, here's why I'm here, is actually really useful because you take away that whole process of like what might be your covert motivation, or at least you downgrade it. And then the other is like, um, if I'm having a conversation with a conservative, or a conservative's having a conversation with me, like often we will actually be on the same page about values. We might not be on the same page about anything else, but it offers us one little sliver of a place to say like, yeah, I'm into freedom too. Like, I, I love freedom. Um, and <laughs> that's actually like an, a place to start the conversation that then allows me to interpret it in a different way. Uh, another approach here is to say, OK, it's really hard to get people out of their identity groups, but we all actually have a multiple different identities. And um, there's a political scientist who was telling me about where the best uh, cross-partisan conversations happen online. And um, one of the very best places is like sports bulletin boards. And the reason is, like. We're all members of the Yankees tribe like first. And so it doesn't really matter as much that we disagree about something because we have something that binds us together. And so I actually think this is another kind of like around the side intervention, which is like, how do we actually just bring people together under different tents that aren't political tents so that, that opens up that sense of commonality so that then we can have these conversations. Um, and then I don't mean to be flip, but like, the other thing that brings, brings people together is like, has been historically wars. Like the World War II was, um, you know, was the biggest place where America kind of found a, um, you know, sort of a new identity of itself where you had a bunch of people from different classes and races coming together in search of a common purpose. And I've been thinking about this because obviously, um, I don't think a war would be a great solution to the problems that we have right now. But, but that sense of a project, that sense of what is our calling that is, going to be, that is going to be worth it to kind of like hold your nose and work together with someone who you'd otherwise hate, really does feel to me to be missing and, and really important. And um, you know, I think there are any number of hypotheses about what that calling might be. But someone was saying to me, like, this is actually not the, for anyone who's been in a company who has worked at a company, like, when the company is, like, jamming to do something really big and everyone's on the team, like, you don't have the drama that comes up as soon as, like, things are kind of quiet and people get restless and start arguing about who's leaving stuff in the kitchen sink. And so the question is, like, you know, th that's, I think, one of the best ways to, um, you know, to come together and to start seeing things from other points of view would be just to like do something that has nothing to do with that, but that would be a big enough project that it would be worth like a bunch of people coming together to sign up for. So those are um, six or seven, um, you know, possibilities, and um, I'm really excited to kind of have a conversation about what I'm sure I've left a bunch, uh, a bunch out, um, but I would love to have a conversation about about that. Um, and to talk with you, Pete, about all of this. So that's a starter. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's um, actually. Why don't you, why don't you get on this side? And I'll get on this side here. Oh no, yeah, that's fine. Okay. And, uh, and oops. Okay. Well, actually, let's, sorry, let's get in the middle here. Why don't you shift this? <laughs> and let's cl click one more time. Oh, yeah. Here, I'll uh, click. There right. we go. What's now, New York? Um, 
We might go back to that, though, so let me just hold that. So I was furiously taking notes. This is my <laughs> kind of way of doing things, processing things. Um, and when you started to say you wanted to make a war, I was like, oh, cool, I'm putting that down. But then you, war. Then, then, yeah. then, then, then you pulled back on that one. Yeah. But I didn't actually do as thorough a kind of introduction, I think, is some people might want to do. And so what I thought I'd do just to, as way of back, instead of just jumping right into the eight solutions, is just back up a little bit in how, a little bit going through your career and how you arrived at where you arrived. Yeah. And I think there's some interesting things there. And um, for those of you who don't know Eli, I mean, he, he actually kind of was one of the youngest executive directors, uh, well, he was, uh, your early career, executive director, move on. Yeah. Um, Extremely young for someone running an organization that I think had 8 million people at some point. But what's interesting about that, as I was thinking and reflecting on it, is how your whole job then was how do you ban people into a tribe yeah. that was almost impenetrable from the outside. I mean, you didn't, and you were focused on, on cohesiveness and, and how you didn't want it. And I'm just curious how that impacted your own thinking about this filter bubble situation. Uh, I know at the time you probably were thinking about it, but as you think back on there, did you see how much easier it is, essentially, to, to bind people as opposed to get people to, to build bridges or reach out? Or any, any thoughts on that reflection of, of your assignment then as opposed to what your assignment is now? Um, yeah, it's a great, I mean, I, I, all of that is contextual to this. And um, uh, you know, anyone who's worked in progressive politics also knows that it's, there's no way to bind people together, actually, because everybody has their own issues and, and agendas. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, I think um, uh, one of the things that, that was really interesting about that experience was, um, you know, this question of kind of like different identities and how do you, which, which identities come to the service. And, um, for at move on, um, a lot of people actually weren't at that time as much like I'm a partisan Democrat as um, you know it was a sense of like I'm not part of the political conversation in a very like um, you know George W. Bush era um, you know dominated moment um, and so uh, there's a great essay about you know I think w one of the challenges is there. Are, it is useful for communities to come to, the only way you get diversity is when communities kind of can create a little melting pot or a little place where they bubble up ideas and start to come up with a sense of their own identity. You want that, but then what you also want is kind of cross argument and cross um, discussion. And, um, and, and, and I think what feels different now is the sense that um, there isn't an argument across groups. Um, in the same way, like there isn't there isn't a single thread that we're all so far entrenched in um, our own worldviews that we're having much less trouble even imagining what someone else's might look like. I think um, what it felt like, at any rate, in you know 15 years ago, was that um, there was enough of a kind of like layer of national conversation that. Um, you could make these kind of arguments across. And so, um, you know, I think uh, th that's one of the things that comes to mind. But, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, then you went on to found Upworth, and you made a mention right. of it here, but I just yeah. wanted to, and again, for folks that you might want to describe what you were doing there, but essentially from the outside, you guys were perfecting ways to essentially optimize media to reach and be shared. And, 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 but it was good media, or it was good ideas. But you guys were really on the cutting edge of the kind of A-B testing and, 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 and multiple ways to actually get ideas out. Right. And again, at the time, now looking back on it, was that part of innovating a, a part of the problem at some level? Or was it just something that, uh, I, I'm just curious how you look back, because you then were th I mean, at times you were able to get things out to millions and millions of people. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and probably people beyond, you know, people who are, you know, in their silos, right? I mean, so there's positive sides to it, too. So I'm just curious what, yeah. what your whole experience of the Upworthy experience well, that was one of the things in the early was, days. Yeah, no, that's what's been really exciting about it is that if you look at the Upworthy audience, it is this kind of surprisingly cross-partisan audience. Um, 
And uh, it is a group of people who generally have come together around, you know, sort of a set of values, but that actually has a bunch of Republicans, independents, and Democrats. And so, um, you know, I think the, uh, you know, from the beginning, having, having done Move On, I didn't want to do, you know, sort of that type of, of media again. Um, and um, we really set out to think about how do you talk about we're not going to pretend that we are um, ambivalent about gay marriage. Like we have a value that says that that is right. But we're also not interested in scoring partisan points and banging people over the head with how wrong they are. And so how would you tell stories that invite people in, that invite in people's curiosity, and that isn't about like kind of shaming them for whatever their perspective is, but that's like, telling an engaging story where you're rooting for the protagonists and you want to be, be with them. Um, and so to me, you know, the, and one of my favorite, you know, sort of one of our all time hits is this piece called Comfort Cases, um, which is about sort of initially it's about this guy who was in the foster care uh, program. He was, um, uh, and he had to like literally take his worldly belongings for, with him from uh, from house to house in a garbage bag. And so he starts this little nonprofit that's like basically just providing like suitcases for kids in this, in this system. But his whole story is like way weirder and more interesting than that. And it's actually the weirdness and interestingness about it, not the like sweet story Good about a guy thing. who's coming back that I like. Because I actually think like curiosity is the biggest antidote if you can pull it out in people mm -hmm. to polarization. Like if you can hook people on just like, well, that's weird. I wasn't expecting that. That kind of like calls attention to the schema that they came to the story with mm -hmm. and then enlist them to like go find out what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And so I think at our best, like that's what we've done is sort of like told stories that were just interesting enough or weird enough, had some texture to them where it was a good story and it was interesting and then it also brought them into the world of someone who they wouldn't otherwise naturally like and also be in the world of. Totally hear you on that. And, but there's also this perfection of the headlines and the right framing. I mean, is, is that, because you guys, yeah. again, were, I mean, my understanding is you used to test 30 headlines. And, right, no, yeah. I mean, maybe explain just that for those that are trying to totally. wrestle yeah, with, no, so, with kind of viral marketing like that. So, I mean, our view was, um, you know, in uh, a newsfeed world, entertainment content is going to win out over content about social issues. And so how do we actually like find ways to engage people around social issues, which will tend to be a little less naturally, you know, clicky than some dude falling off his roof? Um, you know, uh, how do we actually engage people around that stuff? And so we've tried all sorts of things, you know, we've sort of like really set ourselves with that North Star and tried a whole bunch of things, um, which, which, you know, we were kind of like the first to, um, you know, uh, figure out some of these formats and some of these ways of talking to folks um, because we felt like it was really critical to like actually, you know, have a, have a large scale conversation around these, these topics. And so, um, you know, I think in retrospect, like, uh, you know, I don't love some of the headlines that resulted, um, but uh, but I think like I, I feel like it's you know there's there's a a, a sense that um, that that sense of like a, a public sphere or a common set of ideas, um, you know, it, it, we're we're talking about one slice of that which is like the partisan slice, but there's another slice which is it just falls out of you entirely. Like most people don't consume news at all. It's not a problem of they're consuming Breitbart or consuming the nation. They're just out. Right. And that's easier to do than ever before. And so how do you actually like break through that um, and be really aggressive about that? Um, and you guys really kind of, perfected that. And then it kind of went over the whole industry at some level. Yeah. Uh, jammed down again. Um, so now you're the president of Good Media, which is Upworthy is part of that. But part of what you're doing is 
providing kind of consulting to companies who are also trying to understand their branding and how to use media. Say a little bit more about what good media is, for those who don't know it. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, it kind of opens up this question of how do you talk about this kind of filter bubble or how do you reach out beyond that? Yeah. Converted. I mean, talk, talk a little bit about how you're starting to rethink that in your current company. Yeah, so, I mean, we work with a lot of brands where they're, um, so Good Media, uh, we came together with uh, an organization called Good, um, which was a magazine and a digital consultancy. Um, and, um, you know, what we've been trying to do is kind of like, uh, on the one hand, you know, build this, build this uh, media platform, and on the other hand, really sort of distill what we're learning um, for folks who want to, um, you know, do something purposeful and socially positive with their brand. Um, and so, which is a, like a dicey road at this moment because it's very easy to piss people off, it's very easy to do it wrong, um, it's very easy to speak to one side and not the other. And so what we've kind of uh, been doing is trying to figure out like what are programs that can engage people across these divides or engage them in different ways. Um, and um, you know, a lot of it is, you know, this question of is there, you know, it, it's funny how brands are still so reluctant to speak to, like, what they believe in or what their values are in any kind of real sense. Um, and what we remind them is, like, not being in that conversation doesn't earn you any trust. Like, people don't trust someone who is opaque and obscure and whose motives they can't ascertain. And so you kind of just have to like figure out a way to um, speak authentically about what you believe in, but do it in a way that's not alienating or not needlessly kind of dunking on the other side. Um, and so that's you know that's that's the kind of stuff that we do with with brands. Can can you say anything about the brands, the kind of brands, or are they are they kind of socially kind of motivated brands, or are they sure? Just yeah, I mean generally we, we, we work with. Um, you know, Unilever and Starbucks and Google and a whole bunch of brands that, um, you know, that have programs that are that are have some kind of social good or social impact mission. How, how much in that, just out of curiosity, um, is getting caught up in this polarization filter bubble discussion? Like, how frequently are you hammering that out with? Yeah, well, it's, you're a, I mean, with it, in, in it's a very. I mean, everybody's being called on to take sides, um, and. Um, you know, there's a lot of activism that's happening that's, uh, you know, that's calling on brands to, you know, if it's the Parkland, you know, shootings going after advertisers on some of these programs or, um, you know, the, everybody's kind of like being watched very carefully. And I think, um, you know, the truth is there are a lot of brands where like there isn't a, some core purpose that's very appealing or they don't know what it is or they've lost sight of it. Um, you know, so there, there are people who we haven't been able to figure out how to help. But, um, but I think often it's about kind of having the, the, the courage to say like, no, just we believe in this. And there's something about that that people respect. Like there's something about the tiptoeing around it um, that's actually less, you know, what, what you find if you're getting together people from different political points of view is that, um, is that you know, saying like, I'm on the fence or I don't have any views, it doesn't buy you any friends. It doesn't buy you friends on the side that you actually sort of sympathize with. And it doesn't buy you any friends on the other side. Or saying like, look, here's who I am, here's what I stand for. There's credit that you get for that even if you disagree. And so um, finding those points to like kind of encourage people to stand up um, is, a, is a piece of so, work. So one that's been prominent, for example, Delta taking the position on Canceling the NRA special deal, and anyhow, they got caught in the middle of that. Would, yeah. do, you think, do you think they handled that in a kind of way that would values first? It worked, or I'm just curious. One of any of these. I mean, I would say honestly, it's hard. As soon as you're reacting to something that's happening out in the public, like it's harder to. Like, it'd be much better if they um, had figured out some of these things that they believe in first, because once you're reacting it's hard to read it as a, anything other than a reaction. Like, they, like uh, so, but I'm not actually close enough to it to yeah, like just curious. Give, a, give a strong critique. All right, well we're gonna be turning it over here. So people think about your questions or positions. There are things about this kind of 
the set of seven that he threw out there, too, that we could build on. But um, something everybody kind of faces, I'll just end up with this, is like the, the classic um, Thanksgiving family dinner kind yeah. of thing. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, it's gotten so bad that, you know, even that most intimate kind of gathering is, is really starting to unravel. And yeah. uh, I don't know, have you any thoughts on just literally bringing it even really personal to beyond kind of a brand or kind of organization or what do we do for the country, but like, what do people just do? I mean, I guess the same things apply, your same principles as opposed to, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm literally from a family in Minnesota, we're split 50, because kind of a battleground state, or, you know, bluish, but essentially half my family's conservative Republican, half is liberal Democrat, and my little sister's the swing vote, basically. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, in, it's interesting how that's gotten increasingly difficult, actually, over yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would say, like, certainly the affirmation still applies and is, is critical, which is, that, like, people, people get stressed about their identity or, or cling to their beliefs when they feel insecure. And so finding ways to give people that sense of, it, of security, that opens up the possibility of a conversation. Um, and so to me, like, if, if we were to approach those conversations with that first in mind, you'd approach it really differently than like, so what do you think about Trump? Well, I hate him. Well, I love him. You know, and you go off to the, off to the races. Um, uh, you know, I think... I think the values thing. Um, the shared values piece like that, yeah. is like is is critical. And then I also think like the shared project, like I you know, what research would say is that if you all, you know, sort of together built something together, stacked some wood together, whatever it was, before you have that conversation, that that would actually help a lot. And there's just amazing research where like if you have um, uh, you know, if you're working on kind of racial bias, you know, and you have people play tug of war divided by in, in racial groups, um, you know, the implicit bias that you can measure goes way up. And if you do mixed groups and have them play tug of war, the implicit bias goes way down. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that feeling of we're on a team doing something together um, actually, you know, just changes your relationship with other people who are around you. Um, in a way that's really, that's really powerful. All right, take that all home to the holidays. Uh, we got a ways to go here, but I'll tell you what, what I'm gonna do is push the, 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 the slide back, and I just wanna see before we get into the conversation here with everybody, um, I just wanna see if you had to take one of these as your leading idea that could actually do something concretely positive in this, and you can think about it from the, point of view of the polarization of the country, business, how are you going to reach out to other folks? I just want to kind of go around and get a show of hands. It's just you, you just get one vote. Like, what's the one thing here you can think of doing? And I'm just curious how that might spread out. And uh, Eli here, who's probably collecting data for his next book on this yeah, right. thing, will uh, would be interesting too. So who, who think the number one thing is building relationships? Oh, wow. A lot of hands there. All right. How many think empathic exercises that like this narrative kind of thing all right there's folks that definitely think that's good oh, that's another okay how about this affirmation you are a good that's the real you're a good person kind of thing right up oh, on the way back there too oh ben uh lead with values versus tribal signifiers the values that seems like a pretty good balance there build cross-cutting tribes there's one, two, few. <laughs> cross, which one? No, wait, the cross-cutting tribes, okay. Sports. The, the sports know, one, the sports yeah. one. Actually, yeah. Theo, that, there's one that you were all involved in. Uh, war, how many, one? no, not war, but a big, another big project. How many think that's really the kit, critical thing? That's interesting. That's an interesting mix. And yeah. then what else? That's what we're going to get into. What's interesting about what just happened there was, with a few exceptions, it was pretty evenly distributed. Yeah, no, it was. On the idea, affirmation didn't have a lot of fans, but other than that. And, and what, what do you make of that? Anything you make of that? I, I clearly haven't affirmed the audience enough. Um, <laughs> no, not just on that one, but on all of them. Basically. No, yeah. I mean, 
It's interesting. I mean, I actually haven't done this exercise before, so I'm, it is interesting to see how spread out we we are. Um, it's probably you know probably the answer is all of the above, um, and sort of what your entry point is in the in the conversation. But um, yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear also. I mean, yeah. So let's turn what, over. What are, let's do that. And what we're doing here is this is uh, being captured on video. It's live streamed. It also goes edited later. So when you get the mic, uh, wait for the mic. And also stand up and just kind of identify yourself, and you can put yourself in context of what you do or how you relate to the conversation, or however you want to do it. And then, then uh, I'd love to hear some thoughts on uh, what people make of this, particularly if you have any new ideas that are going on here. But anyhow, let's put it out. All right, in the back here, let's start right there on the steps. And there's two folks. The yeah, get the mics. Yep, bring the mic over there. Yeah, I think I think it's no because it goes out to the live stream. You you they won't hear it unless you have that mic. You want to just stand up too? Hey guys, just, we're uh, gonna shoot this too. I'm uh, James Felton Keith. I, I represent uh, Personal Data. We're the largest data trade association um, on the planet. And um, anyway, I like a lot that you had to say. Uh, I raised my hand earlier on affirmation, but when you started your your talk, you mentioned scarcity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, personally, and I've been thinking about this issue quite a bit, I think that scarci scarcity at the individual level is, uh, is subject to perception. I think it's quite relative. And so if I see that you have you know, $116 billion, let's just say hypothetically, and I have zero, yeah. right? I think you're trapping too much value. And so even as resources of sorts, whether they be products or services, are relatively abundant relative to last week or 20 years ago, I still think I have relatively little access to resources that affirm my life. And so I don't feel that even though we live in the West in a place of, again, relatively hyperabundance, that I am a part of that equation. And so I am desperate. And so my measures are desperate. And so the way that I interact with the world is desperate. And it creates a rift. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we are right now. We in the United States kind of thing? Or? I think or across the board. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I was in Warsaw the other week, and it's the same over there as it is over here. It's really nice to be in the center of town. It's really nice to be in Manhattan. But like, uh, it's different everywhere else, even in Brooklyn. I don't make it to Brooklyn much, but. <laughs> so I just want to throw that out there. Is yeah. I think it's something else that we should be noodling on is how we distribute um, affirmation, how do we distribute value yeah. um, as a sort of economic measure to really physically invite people in. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's provocative. And, and you know, there's this big discussion that's happening about um, to what degree is what what's driving people certainly towards Trump, um, you know, uh, a sense of economic being left out economically. And to what degree is it um, anxiety about status? And I actually think like that anxiety about status to me is, I, I think maybe this is what you were saying, but, it, but um, it's less to do with sort of how I'm actually doing economically or even how I'm going to do economically, but it's what does that mean about where I fit into the world and how important I am in the world? And that anxiety, you know, I think is is a kind of an undercurrent in a lot of what we're experiencing right now. So I don't know if that's exactly, you know. Okay, Michael, let's, let's yeah, let's, if, if people want to just throw their hands up and so I can keep an idea, I'm going to out a few people here for sure because there's a few people that could really contribute here. But yeah. Michael here wants to, could we get a mic here to Michael? Michael's one of our regulars, but he's always got something interesting to well, ask. Michael Smolens of Dotsa, we're a technology business to enable video to be in all languages, so everybody. So my personal sort of take on this is that where we are today has taken about 40 years to get us here from like 1980. If you, you can argue plus or that sort in, in your mind, if all of these things happen successfully, if whatever you're talking about works and you have new relationships and empathy and all of these, in your mind, how long do you think it could take to move in the direction that you really would like to see, the way, that Upworthy is, that Move On was created for. Knowing what hasn't worked 
and knowing what's not working now with the best combinations of everything, what, what, what do you think? Is it, is it a generation? Is it two generations? What, what do you, how long do you think it would take to really move the needle yeah. in, a, in, a, in a direction that, that you're happy with? Well, that's a I good question. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, my, my sort of underlying assumption is things are gonna change more and more rapidly. So I would, I would anticipate probably that the pendulum will swing and swing again fairly quickly. But I would say, I mean, my vote was for this big project notion, because I think actually like people can really shift, you know, if there was an alien invasion tomorrow, like you would see a lot of changes in geopolitics and in how people were engaging with each other and a bunch of this stuff would just drop away. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't, no one's like come up to me with a, you know, sort of, I haven't heard the perfect pitch for what that is that would unite people, but I think in those contexts, people can shift really quickly. Um, where, where are the aliens when you need them? I yeah, mean, really. Honestly, that, this well, is, they're here. <laughs> you saw the videos from CNN. They're... No, that's awesome. Um, anyhow, uh, there's other folks here, but we got, we just, let's get the person. Hi, how Hi. are you? My name is Dr. Lisa George. I'm with Healthcare Coverage and Services. And I'm, I appreciate how you made a negative thing like war into a positive thing of bringing people together. Um, I'm curious if you consider the Me Too movement something that is like a big project. And also I'm curious to know, are you, they asked us which we thought would be the biggest, which one out of the seven do you think is the biggest? So, I, I mean, I do think this big project is probably the fastest route to building a more kind of cross-integrated and um, less divided society. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, I'm losing track of the first part of the question. The, um, the can you? Yeah. Um, the Me Too movement. Oh, yeah, right. Also, yeah, so yeah, the yeah. Me Too movement, yeah. Um, I think it's a huge project, and I think it's a critical project. Um, I don't know that, you know, I think the challenge with that project is, um, you know, how do you enlist everybody, including men? And thus far, I think, um, you know, men have not, figured out what their role is appropriately in that conversation in a, in a leadership way. And so I feel like, um, by which I mean like, what is your role in that project if you're a man and you're for that project? Um, and so I think, you know, that's something I am thinking about. Uh, but I think, um, uh, I think probably the kind of project uh, you know, I think probably projects that um, you, you want something that cues some other kind of all-encompassing identity that uh, that people that people that doesn't sort of uh, play along some of the fault lines that people are already kind of inclined to to have friction around. If if your purpose is to build one unified group, I think. There's, there's many other reasons to pursue that project that I'm for anyway. You know, I mean, but I'm not sure that as a unifying everybody comes together moment that that's the place that I would start. Well, you know, the big project, I almost, I'm also very kind of drawn to the big project, but I was thinking, oh, climate change, wouldn't that do it? But again, it's one of those things that automatically kicks in about op opposition. The one thing that seems to me is, was would there be a restructuring the economy, a yeah. kind of economic project. And actually, there, I, I got There's somebody lurking out here. It's Andy Stern. I wouldn't mind calling out here, but if or, or not. But there's other people here. But the, the question is, it seems like there's something that would unify, not just on this in the United States, but also European, that there's something going on about a different kind of economy that would touch everybody. Yeah, that might be the project. Do you, do you feel that? And I don't know if Andy wants to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some big infrastructure something, for example, 
you know, which, I mean, there's a different kind of economy in general, and then there's also a big economic project that you could get everyone involved in. So a national infrastructure program that was a, at a large scale that was funded in part by, you know, private entities and in part by public entities would be the kind of thing that would start to, you know, if everyone after high school spent a year going somewhere else and building a bridge, you would start to have some of the same effects that World War II had in terms of cross understanding and integration as a country. Um, and so that's where my head goes, but I don't know. Um, uh, okay, what, you, are you, any thoughts yeah, on that? Hey, just, Andy, I would love to. So now Andy Stern here, just identify yourself, but he's kind of up in that space right now. So, Thinking big on economics. So I'm Andy Stern. I used to run a union. I Can used to run up? a union called SEIU, and now I'm part of the Economic Security Project, whose purpose in, at the moment is focusing on the question of can cash transfers actually solve some of the inequality that people have. But I do think you know there's been a lot of recent research that talks about whether it's guaranteed jobs or cash transfers that has remarkable cross. When you stick to the value questions, not the position questions about whether people in this country who want to work or who can't work, you know, should be poor or should not have opportunities. You know, I think we're seeing, if you handled it right, kind of talking about the economy differently than let's tax the rich or let's screw the corporations or let's do something very specific. So I think there is a moment of anxiety and insecurity that exists right now, and we should not fall into the blaming you know, place, but see it as an opportunity to test out some of your ideas. Okay. Let's get a mic here to Camel. Oh, um, do you want to stand up and identify yourself? Hi, I'm Camilla Berungi. I'm a strategist uh, and a creative, and I picked war. And another project, I actually lived in war, and I've been, I've experienced countries that have recovered from war, like for example, Rwanda. I don't know if you guys are paying attention to what's happening in Rwanda and how they've recovered after 25 years after the genocide. But I wanted to say that there is a big project already happening. 173 countries have signed with the Sustainable Development Goals. So that's the big project, that's the big economic project. Yeah. It's already happening. A lot of corporations are signed up to this, it just seems not to translate with the consumer. Like, I work within that space. I work along the sidelines of the Sustainable Development Goals, and I just don't understand how, you know, the tech community, the innovators are just not aware that there's a huge commitment and uh, there's trillions of dollars poured down this space, and it's, it's, it's right there, it's, it's in front of us. It was an agreement that was signed, and hey, let's, that's the big project, I feel like. That sounds great. No, la last week, I gave a talk in Mountain View before 300 people with blockchain, very cutting edge technologists, and I asked that question to the audience, and only 20% of the audience there had ever heard about the sustainable. So, so it's not a, the, the sustainable development goals is not something that's a common knowledge among the normal population. This was really smart people well, in Silicon Valley, too. and they hadn't or, heard about or, it. Yeah. No, no, no. What, no. What, what do you, Eli, your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, um, it, it's almost like those are big audacious goals, but are they kind of pitched right or? Or because it sounds like the the war is you know hey we're all going to get killed or you know it's just all encompassing. There's something about the all encompassing thing that yeah. that doesn't hit even though it's an ambitious big goal. I would say I don't know. I'm just curious if you think there's other elements of the big audacious goal. That well, the have other to be I mean the a threat or something. yeah no the threat is critical. Like the the I'm sort of as a like pragmatist I guess on this front. Like the thing about the Yankees example is like, that works because there's the Red Sox, <laughs> you know? And so you can get a great, there's a different fracture point. It just happens not to be a political fracture point. And so I, I think, um, you know, as someone who has been kind of like a, a like, you know, sort of global, um, community idealist, um, you know, I think the last year or two has really made me kind of reconsider that in a way, which is to say that, 
I think when you look at the needs that people have in their identities, it is to exclude someone. Like that's part of the deal. Part of the package is like I'm special because I'm not this other group. And I think we can be creative about how to arrange that so that we're not always excluding the same people or so that it's the Red Sox versus the Yankees instead of you know, a, a class or racial or political one. But, but I, I think that. So you think it's like baked in DNA, like kind of roaming the savanna kind of deep in I think a, that in people humans. need, yeah, people need to feel connected to some group that makes them feel special. And I'm not sure that as much as I would like to all be part of one global society, I'm not sure that um, we can ever like have that as our primary identity, that I'm a citizen of Earth, unless they're citizens of some other planet. Like, I mean, I mean that literally. Like, but I'm curious, someone was saying like, they totally disagree, and I would love to hear. Okay, yeah. how about in the back there? Um, yep, let's get him, Mike. And, and sorry, there are people. Oh gosh, okay, we got a bunch here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm I'm Aldo, and I'm a documentary photographer. So I have two things to say. First thing, I raise my hand for building relationship because as a photographer, 15 years ago, I was like in Kosovo, and I was covering the the post-war situation there. And uh, there were these two ethnic groups, like the Serbian guys, let's say, and the Albanian guys, they were fighting each other a lot. And uh, what were you saying just right now? Um, when I was asking to one of those two, what do you think about the other? They said, oh, they are martyrs, they destroyed my country, and all those rapists. And, yeah. But then, as they were neighborhood since like a couple of years before, when I was making the, the name, what do you think about him? So, oh, he was an amazing person. I, I gave him my, my child to, to raise. I, I was spending a lot of time with him because they were not thinking that if they were, if the, I'm sorry, my English is not perfect. But um, the Albanian guy was thinking, if he was thinking, what do you think about the Serbian guy, the, the worst thing possible. But when he was thinking, what do you think about Dimitri? Oh, Dimitri yeah. was amazing. He was my friend. He was really my neighborhood. So, this is why I say building relationship is my first choice. And this is why I not do agree with, with the war thing. Because as you said, you always need an enemy. And uh, also uh, with my European heritage, I have to say, we, I feel that community thing here is way more highlighted than what we have in Europe. Like, I, I, I feel a citizen of the world. This is why I'm here, because like, I, I don't, for me to be Italian or to be or to live here in the U.S. or to live in China, it's no problem. It's Earth, and I feel there's many more people that I know from the European, with a European heritage that feel this way than American people that I know that feel yeah. this way. So I don't know. It's it's just too much simplified, but just the yeah. How about the woman? That's a beautiful thing. But um, you could go ahead. Do you want to respond to that? And then. No. Oh, you seem yeah, to want to talk right yeah. away to that. Do you, can you just stand up and identify yourself? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I agree with that sentiment. Also, uh, from Europe, also happened to be Albanian. Um, so that fits into that story. I agree with that sentiment, but, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that Europe is more tolerant than the States. No, 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 I don't, I don't um, you know, in, man, in many ways, I think we, uh, there, there's a lot of racism in Europe and just... Yeah. Uh, just a lot of exclusion in general. And uh, I guess where I'm heading with this is, to me, the most important thing is being exposed to other people, different cultures, uh, different backgrounds. And um, that's really, I mean, not, not being secluded, right? And that's, that's really, as a citizen of the world, the part of the reason why in Europe you get that is because you, you, you're, you're close to a lot of other countries and a lot of other cultures. Um, and it's something that you might not get in the United States per se, but uh, uh, I see it as the that that that's that to me is the most uh, effective way to to change somebody's perspective on, on another group of people. Um, I did have a question for you though, and that was around, you know, all of these ideas are very good ideas uh, in isolation, right? Um, how do you compete with something as fundamental as a computer logarithm? categorizing people, 
um, you know, into specific buckets and giving them an infinite amount of information. Yeah. How, how do we uh, implement this at a large scale? That's a great question. I, I think that's one of the key questions. And I think I've been, you know, quite involved in a bunch of conversations with folks at these companies, you know, trying to think this through. I think um, the, well, two, two thoughts. Um, one that I've just been mulling on recently is, um, I think, from, from Tim O'Reilly, uh, who talks about, um, uh, you know, that everybody talks about sort of the risk of super intelligent AI. And that we're going to have these runaway AIs that, um, you know, we ask them to make paper clips, and they get so obsessed with making paper clips that they wipe out the human race in the process of <laughs> making the most efficient paper clip. Right? This is the paper clip problem from AI. And he he makes this really powerful point, which is, um, you know, businesses and corporate and governments are super intelligent AIs. We, they already exist. They can do all the things that a super intelligent AI can do. They can process information at a much higher volume. They can take in information from all sorts of places. They can use it to make decisions and make them with a lot of force in a different places. So that already exists. And sure enough, when the metrics are not set right, they veer off in bad directions, which is exactly what we're seeing right now, whether it's Facebook or whether it's you know companies optimizing for a short-term return or whatever it is. Like, so this isn't a far future problem. This is a very present problem. I would suggest that one of the biggest challenges of this moment, and the one that I'm very like interested in having a conversation about, is we don't know how to formulate what we want if we want a democracy in a kind of metricable or machine-readable way. Like we, we don't know. Um, so so, and this is kind of the big problem, which is like. Some polarization is good, but too much polarization is bad. What do we want to say about what, how would we instruct someone, <laughs> you know, how would we instruct an AI to set the, set the limit rate? I don't think we know the answer to that question. And so starting to think about like, what are, what are the, the metrics or goals that we ought to be setting for how our social fabric works in a really rigorous way seems to me to be really important because that's the kind of thing that a company like Facebook understands. Like if you say to Facebook, like you got to keep this number between seven and five, that's the kind of problem they can solve. Building a democracy isn't the kind of. I mean, it, it, I don't think we know how to ask the question right. I guess is my is my point. So is the argument rigorous? Uh, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's not even, I mean, I think there's regulating. some regulation of Facebook that would be good. Um, but I don't think that, I think there's a bunch of more fundamental questions about like, how do we think about the structure of a good society in a, in a way that we can measure and communicate about? Yeah. <laughs> that I don't think we have, in, I think it's more, in, I don't think we know the answers to that yet. And I think that's actually like, part of what we're running up against is we don't know how to tell the machine what we want. If I could just add to that, just, just for those that are interested, uh, Tim O'Reilly did a, a What's Not San Francisco with us, yeah. which was a fascinating time, uh, really around the launch of his book, which is a great book, by the way. Um, uh, and he, he kind of rethinks what an algorithm is. And you kind of alluded to it, but he says, you know, right now, you know, the economy is set to a certain algorithm, which is you have to maximize shareholder value. That's just an algorithm. That's just like what a computer does. It's just set the rule, and then everybody operates on the rule, right? And so you could retweet that algorithm at the societal level, and you could get a very different outcome. And so he's just challenging us at this time, where we're really kind of at this moment of like, what is the basic reset that we want to get? I think that's kind of what you're getting at. And, and I think it's a really fascinating kind of way to think about this, not just at the highest level of the economy, but also how these 
these, these other uh, things operate. Okay, there's a ton of questions here. I do know the, uh, this guy in the corner has been saying it, and then, then we're going to get over here. We'll get to you in the front. Yeah. Hi, I'm Could James. Could you stand up oh. and uh, inter identify yourself? I'm James. I'm a designer, maker, and I have a signed cop copy of the filter bubble. Thank you very much. Um, I've got two questions. The first is, is a cross-cutting tribe just a new tribe um, in that if you have two sides and you form a, a third side, if they don't sort of penetrate that audience deeply, then it's just a new side. And New York, to me, is a cross-cutting tribe fighting mm -hmm. against other monocultures that this is essentially cross-cutting. Um, my second question is, if you ask the 20 questions that precede a final question, you can kind of control the answer of that final question. Um, did you test whether you could change people's minds on upward the, to control the last 20 links they watched and then like, change the political view of someone? It's fascinating. Um, should I answer that? Yeah, no, 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 go yeah. for it. I was just saying the next um, question. No, that's a fascinating question. We didn't, no, we didn't do that. Um, but, uh, but we do think about, you know, sort of how do we, um, you know, how do we persuade people in a way that is durable and that they'll listen across these divides? And, um, uh, you know, for, for me, um, part of that's about sort of the conscious act of, like, I'm going to make an argument to you or I'm going to tell you a story. You can, you know where we're coming from and you can kind of evaluate it on that basis. Um, so, you know, certain, so some of the kind of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, cognitive psych stuff that one could do, I think, isn't in the service of like making arguments in a democracy. Um, you know, I think uh, on the cross-cutting tribe question, I guess this is getting back to, I mean, I haven't articulated this super clearly, but my view increasingly has become like, we only really understand ourselves in the context of tribes. We all belong to multiple of them. This current moment has made it a bad word, but if you talk about communities or you talk about groups or you talk about identity, it doesn't have to be a bad word. It's just how we understand ourselves in the context of society. What I think is scary is both people generally, like it seems like that layer, like that stack of different identities has thinned. Um, and there's a bunch of sociology looking at like, people are just part of less of those kinds of things, which may be why partisan identity has become so much more important to people as like the, the prism through which they look at everything because like they're not as members of a bowling league or members of whatever other like kind of association as much. Um, you know, I think the other piece is it feels like whereas um, spatially it used to be that those groups would sort of cover more ground. <laughs> um, like I'm in the center, but there's a group that brings me over here and a group that brings me over here and a group that brings me over here. It feels like they're more stacked on top of each other so that you're kind of more likely to run into the same people in a different context than totally different people in different contexts. And so to me, that's how I'm thinking about sort of some of the challenges. I don't know if that, that may be way too abstract, but that's kind of where my head's at. Um, I, now, I don't want to hold too many folks away from the cold beers, and yeah. uh, there's a little more food to come out. But uh, but this, okay. yeah. uh, but we still have a, we still have a few minutes here, so sure. more I'm than a, one question. But go ahead. I'm a Harvard Topsicalian of uh, Cognitum, which is an artificial intelligence platform. Oh. And uh, actually, the aspect of data does concern me because uh, I wonder if anyone has done the research or has even looked at this issue, the the polarity and the difference in values, almost. Comparing it to looking at the looking at it from almost like religion, because I even discussing with people or, or getting into arguments with people, let's simplify it and say like the Trump camp and the Hillary camp. It's almost like they're different faiths, and no matter what data you present to them, they ignore the data or they'll say yeah. that well that's just a slice of data. Yeah. So data, just like in religion, you cannot convince someone of a certain faith with data it's almost becomes like this is the same kind of value systems that are in place now. Uh, you cannot convince with data. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious to know if anyone's even looked at it from, from that angle. Y yes. And I mean, I think we can say there's a lot of evidence that people are not making these decisions on the basis of information or data. 
you can't provide them with more information and they change their minds. Um, people look at signifiers like, uh, you know, what does Donald Trump think or what does Barack Obama think and adjust their opinions about something dramatic. Like if you look at Republican opinions about Putin before and after the election, it's like a 40 point swing. It's like people went from hating him to thinking he was a great guy. Um, but I think that suggests something else, which is really critical here, which is that's because like for 99.9% .9 of people, it doesn't matter at all what their opinion of Putin is. Like it's never gonna have any practical consequences in their lives, what their opinion of whether he's good or bad. And one of my favorite pieces of kind of behavioral economic science is like these studies where you pull people and you ask them like, is climate change real or something? And then you say, or, or a better question is, is the climate you know, getting hotter every year? And a bunch of conservatives will say, no, it's not getting hotter every year, which is empirically true. Um, and then you say, like, I'll give you 10 bucks if you can guess how much the climate has gone up over years. And people go, like, yeah, it's gone up a bit. Um, because there's something, there's some, so I guess what this gets to for me is, like, people evaluate sort of the utility of an idea or a position in two ways. One is kind of an instrumental value, which is, like, I know this information and so it's useful in my life in some tangible way. I can change the battery of my car. And then the other is this sort of like, I'm signifying something with this. And often what we're talking about in politics is things that have like high signifying value, low practical utility value. So it's easy to say like I like Putin because it says something about me, but I, I, I'm, I, I'm not gonna lose anything by having that view. Um, and so, I feel like you know, the closer you get to what people actually have a stake in, the more you get to a willingness to actually see data and make decisions accordingly. But I think part of this is that politics doesn't feel relevant in that way right now. It feels relevant more to signify something than to actually make a difference in their lives. Fascinating. Okay, let's go here. We got a last couple of questions and then um... We have Hi. A social life. Hi, Alfie Rustam. I'm an uh, author and tech entrepreneur. And last week I just launched my book, uh, Hashtag 2084, where humanity is enslaved by a super intelligent AI using the anomaly detection system, which keeps us with, within very narrow prescribed norms. Mm. And so there's an instance of where technology is used to, and it's allegorical to what's happening. Yeah. But I'm wondering if on the flip side, if we can actually have a diversity measure because I, I'm fed up of getting all this content that's geared to very narrowly yeah. towards my interests or what they perceive my interests to be. And they, I'm wondering if there's, if there's a way of increasing that. Because a lot of these solutions, I wonder about scalability. So I'm wondering if we can increase diversity in content consumption using technology as a solution rather than as a cause of the problem. So uh, y yes, and it depends on what problem you're solving, whether that's a good thing or not. Like, in other words, I would submit that merely making everyone consume a little bit of everything wouldn't solve some of the divides that we have right now, wouldn't create necessarily more cross-partisan understanding. Um, but I think it would do a bunch of things as far as people just having a wider view of the world, having more serendipity in their lives. So I think it sort of, it does get back to this question of like, what are you, you know, that first slide that I put up of like, what's the goal? Is the goal, you know, serendipity and a, and a broad view of the world in itself? Or is the goal, I mean, I will say one interesting thing that I was reading recently is that one of the effective interventions when it comes to partisan, you know, sort of news sources is if you simply sort of provide people a map of where the, where the, periodical or article they're reading right now is on the kind of partisan spectrum with very little narration. A lot of people will go like, oh, I seem to be reading a lot of, like I wasn't as conscious of reading only stuff that was on the left or the right as I am now. And I'll kind of like moderate or at least I'll be skeptical of stuff that's way out there. Um, and so that might be, that's one kind of feedback mechanism that you could enlist to solve for that tendency, but to your point, that might actually 
narrow the diversity of ideas that people encounter. So some of these values are like naturally in tension. I think that's part of why it's an interesting and hard conversation because you don't want to crank it all the way up to diversity. You don't want to crank it all the way down to one monoculture. I'm going to take this moment just to make a point because we're at the very end here. But a lot of what this series, it, it, it's, it hadn't occurred to me until we were talking about this, but a lot of what this series is here and what we've tried to do at San Francisco is specifically cross-fertilize different innovators in different fields and cross-fertilize a network of artists and, and you know, people from fashion and the people, technology and AI and you know, all kinds of stuff that's happening here. And we have found over the last two and a half years now in San Francisco, it just opens up so much new creativity. And, and again, the diversity principle, as much as we're talking about these homogenous kind of groups, it is interesting how inter, multidisciplinary interconnections are, in fact, where so much creativity and so yeah. much kind of, of the innovation basically comes from. Yeah. So it's a funny kind of situation that our, that our, that our kind of society is going into this kind of homogenous kind of groupings at a time when we were learning very clearly that there's essentially, uh, it's those multiple perspectives that really, and the diversity actually brings up too much. And again, it's another pitch for like why we're gonna be doing for the next year here, systematically going through different fields all the time. And we welcome you to all come back and bring folks from the other fields as well, because we're building a network here, a diverse network we're trying to figure out that really actually thinks differently. So anyhow, that's my last pitch. We're gonna give one last thing here. Uh, can we get another? perspective and then, uh, sorry about that, and then we're going to have time here for everyone to just chat and Aunt Eli's going to be around here too. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Christine Almeida and um, I am an entrepreneur here in New York. I actually just started a sustainable events company. Okay. So I'm in a unique position actually. Um, I'm originally from Mexico and I uh, lived in Texas, so half of my family is um, very Republican and then obviously, you know, in Mexico, all the Republican have gone a different way with Trump. Uh, so um, our WhatsApp conversations can get very interesting <laughs> and um, very long. Um, anyways, but I found that something that has always kind of brought us together has been events and experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of wondering your views on a sort of bubble that has come around sustainability as a topic. Mm -hmm. And then also um, during these events, um, kind of thinking about music, art, and fashion as a language yeah. and how that could kind of serve as creating its own tribe. And um, yeah, kind of not as much sports, but um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the same way, serving the same function that yeah. you know, the Yankees would serve, but yeah. you know, music. <laughs> Art and music, awesome. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I think um, a shared experience is a really powerful, I mean, that, when you talk about World War II and what it did for American identity, it's probably just this experience of everybody going through this traumatic, momentous, heroic journey together, you know. Um, uh, and so I think that's absolutely one of the ways that you can kind of bind a group together. Um, you know, and I think there's definitely something to, I mean, the, the same political scientists who look at sports actually looked at sort of fan groups of um, some TV shows and found a similar phenomenon. And my favorite one was Lost, where the Lost fan boards apparently were just like this very respectful yet interesting discussion of politics across party lines. Um, I guess the, the, the last thing I'll say on this is, is um, there's a bunch of research about the role that fiction, fictional storytelling can play in placing people in the same reality, which is sort of a hilarious notion that like we have to escape to fiction in order to like live in a shared reality. But actually like if you, the, the classic study is um, if you take a group of people and show them the same study on um, the death penalty, um, people who believed that it was wrong will come away more convinced it was wrong. People who believed that it was right will come away more convinced that it was right. If you instead show them a fictionalized story about uh, what's happening in a death penalty case, um, they'll actually converge more. <laughs> and the reason is, I mean, very simply, like 
you can't argue with the facts in fiction. The facts are the facts. <laughs> and so then you can actually sort of wrestle with like the ethics or the connotations of that. So I actually think like there is a role for the arts in all of this in helping us like like if we can't if we can't find shared space in waking life, maybe we can in our dreams is like kind of the the notion there. Um, but anyway, thank you all for this conversation. It's been yeah. really great and I look forward to continuing. Well let's give them a great hand, folks. Thank you so much, and there's more food, more drink. We'll hang out here, he's around, and uh, also come back and bring interesting characters from different fields who would like this kind of conversation going forward. Thank you again.